Gary Shanche, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're releasing your book this Friday, The Conscience of an Anarchist. Great news. Yeah. And uh, I spent a lot of time with this this past week, and I wrote this that I think this may have, time will tell, but I think it has the makings of a classic. It does something that I've not really seen uh, anyone else do, which is put in a very short space. Well, it's not so short. It's a medium-length book, really, but a kind of comprehensive understanding uh, and I use the word understanding instead of ideology because I think that's really what you're promoting. Am I right? Yeah, you know, I think understanding is a great word for what I'm up to here. What led you to write the book? I think probably in part a desire to just understand my own thought processes and the factors that really mattered most to me in making me an anti-statist, and in part I think the desire to explain the uh, opposition to the state uh, that I embraced uh, to people who might not be inclined instinctively to uh, to head in that direction. Yeah, you know, it, it, and I've said this in several different ways in the, in the little editorial preface, uh, if you're expecting a book that just sort of beats you over the head, you know, or, 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 or asks outrageous things of you, uh, you don't do that. You're dealing with people's regular experiences and regular... Uh, uh, mo the book really calls upon people's normal sense of, of right and wrong and workability and unworkability. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the greatest dangers uh, a certain kind of anarchism can fall prey to is a, a naive utopianism, not opposed to utopianism. I think it's great to dream big dreams and challenge the status quo, but I think sometimes people act as if somehow the kind of style of human existence that anarchism envisions is utterly different from what we experience now with the expectation therefore that uh, you know people have to be completely different society has to be unrecognizable and I think people find that a, a very big leap to, to, to take and I'd like to kind of suggest that that's not really the way to proceed. Well that was the way uh, socialism was promoted right I mean uh, there was a promise of a leap forward in, in human nature uh, unimaginable f things that we've never experienced before and, and the socialist um, outlook on life made a lot of progress I mean you know people found it very compelling I would think that uh, your vision which speaks very plainly about life pretty much as we know it uh, without the bad stuff and more of the good stuff you know would even be more compelling I'd sure like to think so. I mean, I think, uh, of course, people can be inspired by radically different visions, and indeed, obviously, there is something radically different about anarchism, but at the same time, I think people recognize the attempt to, to just remake human nature from the ground up is both likely to fail and likely to provide excuses for a tremendous amount of abuse. And so I, I'd like to think I have something to offer that's more confidence-inspiring than that. Why did you... Why did you invest so much in the word anarchism here. There are many other terms. Well, I guess it's the term that comes most naturally to me. I probably used it because anarchist was the label I naturally applied to myself. But also, of course there are other terms, but anarchist is, I think, pedagogically useful, precisely because it unsettles people and invites them to ask, wow, What's up with this radical word? Do I feel comfortable with that? And then that's an opportunity for conversation. Well, you know, people have asked me why I use the term, and uh, one answer you can give is that, well, it starts fewer fights than saying you're a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or a conservative. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's not really a fighting word. It's just a curious word, you know? It's a provocative word yeah. in, in the best sense. Well, since there's no sense in going through your, your whole book here, I mean, I'd like to ask you about a couple of points in there, but <clears throat> can you tell me a little bit about your intellectual odyssey? I understand that uh, you were, I mean, you come out of a fairly conventional uh, philosophical background. You were a social democrat for many years. Yeah, you know, I... Um I started out, I think, with the profile that a lot of uh, budding adolescent libertarians do, which is to say that I read science fiction, and I programmed computers, I had Goldwater-eyed parents, and I had limited social skills. And uh, during that time, I, uh, I read uh, a lot of uh, classic libertarian stuff. I read Hayek, I read Rothbard, I read Robert Anton Wilson. And... Uh, 
I was probably headed for a uh, conventional, if there is such a thing, uh, libertarian intellectual adulthood. And then I got derailed in college. And uh, in college, uh, I confronted uh, a lot of, uh, I think, just sort of global challenges I hadn't thought about uh, in ways that perhaps I should have uh, as an adolescent. I was kind of overwhelmed by the thought that the world was a pretty awful place, and uh, it seemed as if perhaps somehow the state was the only mechanism that uh, could be used to address that. And so then that uh, led me down uh, this long period uh, of kind of wasted uh, uh, grad school and uh, even law school time when I assumed that somehow uh, I needed to be a statist. And then I think I was brought back to those libertarian roots in large part because the uh, Obama and Bush administrations were so awful and uh, their budding authoritarianism and war making uh, really uh, prompted me to, to revisit my premises and at the same time discover some uh, you know, wonderful and insightful libertarians who helped me to see how I could in effect come home intellectually. Well, do you think that that intellectual journey was in a way beneficial for your thinking in any way? Well, sure. I mean, I think it helped me understand where people uh, on the uh, uh, kind of conventional status side of the political spectrum uh, might be coming from. Uh, I didn't have to view those people as aliens. I think I could understand from the inside what dynamics might be might be driving them. And I hope communicate with them more effectively than might have been the case uh, had I just uh, uh, seen them always from the outside. So, yeah, I think that was, that was beneficial. Well, but even more substantially, we ask a slightly... Uh ask the question a little bit differently. Well, sure. do, you, do you think that your outlook um, was improved by having gone the circuitous route that you did? Well, I guess in the abstract I want to say that uh, any uh, kind of intellectual journey undoubtedly improves understanding and uh, and deepens insight. And uh, yeah, I mean, I hope I I hope I understand the world better uh, better because of this. And uh, so yeah, it's not just a matter of rhetoric, but I hope also uh, also deepened understanding. I do think at the same time that a lot of the insights I came to, I concluded in retrospect. I could have come to without taking that detour. I think that I engaged with uh, some of the people uh, who've uh, enriched uh, enriched my life over the past few years, people like Sheldon Richmond and Robert Long. I think I might have been able to uh, move a bit more quickly to uh, a position that, uh, that ultimately strikes me as satisfactory. But yeah, I think I learned a lot. Uh, and, and your views are uh, not purely intellectual this way, right? I mean, they're it's not just uh, positions you've come to accept, but it's, and I get the sense from reading it, this is something you feel very deeply. Yeah, I, you know, I am, and this has been true throughout my uh, political odyssey, I am viscerally opposed to arbitrary power. Uh, I mean, it was funny that even when I was uh, cheerfully telling people I was a social democrat, I had one uh, friend and colleague who would regularly say snippy things to me about, well, for a libertarian like you, because I think he sensed that uh, you know authority was probably not my favorite thing, and uh, so yeah, this is something that that matters to me at a deep level. The notion that people can peacefully and voluntarily organize their lives together and explore a myriad of possibilities without being forced into uh, conformist straitjackets, yeah, that that matters a whole lot to me. Yes, and, and, and there's, but there's also a way that you argue, and i got to tell you that I'm a very fast reader, but your book um, slowed me down, not because it's a slow read, but because I was so intrigued at how you grappled with the problems that you yourself are setting up. I mean, you set up a problem. You don't knock it down like a straw man. I mean, the reader sees you taking it apart and taking it seriously and looking at it from this angle and looking at it from this angle and this other angle and this other angle patiently um, and with arguments that I, I almost felt that you as an author were, were demanding something of yourself that most authors don't demand which is that the argument thoroughly makes sense to you and to any other conceivable reader. I try really hard both for clarity and for rigor. And obviously, uh, this book is intended to be accessible to any thoughtful reader. Uh, it's not a piece of technical political theory, but at the same time, I really wanted it to be a book that any 
a demanding reader could come to and say, I'm not being shortchanged here. Right. So, I mean, you, you try your best not to leave any loose threads or set up arguments that, that you can win. I mean, in a way, a writer is a, a kind of a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an, <laughs> an advantageous role, you know, in a way. It's like playing chess against yourself. You, you kind of, you always win, right? Right. right. <laughs> but, and yet, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. But, but my, my point is that you didn't take unfair advantage of your opponents in the book. Well, I certainly, I certainly tried not to, and uh, I really wanted to uh, to engage with what I thought were were serious positions and show why I didn't didn't reject them. I hope I wasn't just shooting at straw men. Right. Let me ask you a question about um, your your method in structuring the book, because uh, one of the themes that you get when you're reading your book is that when we're speaking about anarchism, we're really talking about what the whole of life as we know it and understand it in the material world. You know, I mean, th there's a lot of implications of the idea that we can, we can form our own associations, that society can rule itself. So when you set out to write a book on this topic, I mean, why weren't you just over, overwhelmed? I mean, how did you, how did you come to your, the systematic ordering the, of the book that you did? How did you decide what was important and what wasn't important and, and how to lay out the sequence of arguments. Did you spend a lot of time doing that? No, I think actually it was fairly intuitive for me. I mean, uh, it's uh, I just proceeded along the path that probably tracked my own thinking and my own feeling about this matter. And uh, so, uh, you know, I started, uh, you know, with the issue of consent because I think that's been so central. And uh, then... Uh, uh, tried to spend more time alerting readers to all the evidence uh, that uh, really is out there that emphasizes just how viable uh, self-organization uh, by, by social systems really is. Uh, but then what really, I think, struck me as crucial was letting the reader know how devastating and destructive state power really is. And so by focusing on everything from the goodies that the state offers its uh, economic cronies to war making to civil liberties infringement, I felt like I could do two things. I could simultaneously focus on things about which I was really passionate and at the same time tap into feelings on the part of readers who might start out with the assumption that somehow the state was benevolent and I really wanted to uh, to emphasize to them how destructive it really was. Yeah, and, and you really, you really, in other words, you're not, you're not writing a book here for the already, how do you say, converted, right? I mean, this is a book designed for somebody who had never encountered these ideas before and yet, I think that a person who's already convinced of the merit of human liberty and the downside of the state can still learn a lot from your book just by watching. First, you make new arguments. As far as I'm concerned, they're new arguments. Uh, but I think um, there's something more important that you've modeled, you've provided a model for how to argue and how to engage and how to, how to have a civil engagement with ideas that you oppose. Well, I think that's a tremendously important goal for anybody who wants to make social change happen. I mean, I think there are lots of different, uh, I think, complementary strategies for building a free society, but the educational strategy, if it's going to work, can't be one that involves pummeling people, uh, you know, violently and aggressively. It's got to engage people in a way that makes sense to them, and that's something I try very hard to do. There were some arguments in your book that I'm sure, well, let me just say you, you have a lot of footnotes, but not too many. In other words, you know, you're not hiding behind your, your citations at all. It's, you're you're exposing yourself very much, you know, throughout the yes, book. That's and, right. And your argument there's, there's a there's a kind of a confidence there, but um, there were some um, new insights here that helped me enormously. I'm just going to mention one real quick. Sure. Um, so it concerns the issue of a market for intellectual property. Uh, mm -hmm. We have these gigantic rules that uh, try to capture the ideas and assign them to certain firms and say, okay, this is your idea and nobody else can have it. And uh, that's always, I've, I've understood for a very long time that that's, that's wrong and, and you make the argument very well, but you can take it one step further. Uh, you say that the, the market for, um, for these bundles of, 
fake rights is itself uh, discriminatory against um, upstart firms because not everybody can can enter into that market. I mean, people don't have the resources to buy and sell these things. Right. So, so you freeze out uh, people who may be the innovators in a position to dra dramatically transform our lives, precisely because they're uh, they're not able to enter the uh, enter the market. And it's an interesting thing because you, you you call yourself a market anarchist, but you're not for all forms of markets. Well. I'm for all forms of genuinely peaceful voluntary exchange. Uh, and what we see, of course, is that sometimes markets, take for instance markets in slaves, don't really involve that kind of, uh, that kind of exchange. Or markets in pollution rights, or markets in, in intellectual property. There's all kind of fake markets out there, aren't there? Sure. Yeah. yeah, the state created and really designed to benefit the state's cronies rather than to actually facilitate real, uh, uh, real interactions. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I'll tell you where I felt I had a difference with you was on the subject of labor and, and labor unions, although I understand your argument. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I felt like you didn't go back historically uh, far enough, uh, okay. uh, which I think maybe I'll, I'll I'm going to come after you probably in an article about this. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> you don't mind that. <laughs> not at all. That's what, that's what conversation's about. That's why we have these, uh, have these exchanges. So uh, the purpose of writing the book is not to persuade uh, everybody that Gary Shanti uh, has all the answers yeah. to the world. No, I mean, I, obviously, I'd like readers who pick up the book to be people who already believe that, but I don't know that that's likely. So, uh, <laughs> I don't believe it. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, so that's, I think, the highest compliment I can give about your book is that it inspires a great deal of thought, and I would once again encourage people to read it slowly and systematically. It's not a burden; um, it's a joy, actually, to see an understandable, honest, um, you know. Um, uh, anarchist who feels it very deeply and understands all the opponents and engages the, the argument so carefully and so systematically and so sincerely. You know, uh, that's what I would say is true about, about your, your book. It's a sincere work. Well, you know, in turn, uh, it's really gratifying to engage with readers who seek the best in an author and uh, who really uh, want to approach a book uh, hoping to find out something interesting and valuable and read with that kind of attitude in mind and this conversation is a reminder that you're that kind of reader. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, I, when I first looked at the title, um, you, as you recall, I, I thought it was wrong. I've changed my mind completely. I like it. Um, we have a conscience of a conservative. We have conscience of a liberal, right? Now we, have, now we have conscience of an anarchist. Um, and um, that's it. You took on a big challenge. I think you really accomplished it. And let me thank you for um, uh, helping us at the Laissez Faire Club to distribute your work and being so uh, cooperative and generous with it. And also, thank you for your, your time today, uh, especially. Uh, you're very welcome. Have a wonderful day, Jack. Okay, thank you.